Welcome to the sermon podcast of Northridge Presbyterian Church in Dallas, Texas. I'm Betsy Sweetenberg, the pastor here, and I hope that in this podcast, you see what we seek to do week after week, approaching the stories of our faith with a holy curiosity, not shutting the book because the stories are hard or there are truths we'd rather ignore. Instead, approaching scripture, trusting that God will meet us there, full of grace and truth, teaching us something new about how we are to live in this world God so loves. Our reading this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, the third chapter, verses 13 to 17. Let us listen for God's word for us. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. When Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The Word of the Lord. In 2021, The British Broadcasting Company posted an article online entitled, The Surprising Power of Daily Rituals. The author, Karen Johnson, asked the question, why have rituals become such an important part of our lives? Research, she says, identifies three elements of a ritual. They are typified by formality and repetition. Second, they have significant meaning. And third, these ritualized behaviors generally have no obvious usefulness beyond the ritual itself. And then she went on to identify reasons why we need rituals in our lives today. She said they express our deepest values. They express who we really are. Second, she says that rituals buffer against anxiety and uncertainty. Now, none of you may or may not be watching the Cowboys game this afternoon, but in the pregame, you will see those pro athletes going through ritual that they do day in and day out. Why? Because those rituals help decrease their anxiety, and helps them to execute more proficiently. Third, she says that end-of-life rituals create stronger bonds between the ones dying and the loved ones. And last, rituals increase social bonding. They have a sense of creating an atmosphere of trust. This morning, we dive deep into the waters, the ritual waters of baptism, specifically Jesus' baptism and ours. Jesus had grown up. For 13 years, he was a Jewish child, and the stories tell us that he profoundly grew in wisdom and stature and socially and spiritually. And then for 17 years, he was in the carpenter shop. Around the age of 30, John the Baptist began proclaiming about one for whom he was not even worthy to untie the shoes on his feet. John was baptizing people, and 
calling them to something beyond the horizon. We're told that John, that Jesus was baptized by John, and at least two significant things happened. Let's explore them this morning. First, Matthew told us that when Jesus was baptized at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. In baptism, Jesus began a revolutionary movement of love. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann talked about the power of various scripts to define who we are. The dominant script, he says, in our culture is that we're isolated and autonomous beings. We believe that we're endowed with limitless possibility and that progress is ours and that we can live independently of each other. That dominant script is that we're capable of providing all that we need or that we want by ourselves. That things matter over people and more things matter more. Baptism, he says, though, changes the script of our lives and our world. Baptism, beginning with the baptism of Jesus, inaugurates an utterly different worldview. Love is introduced. A love more powerful than our desire to go it alone. More powerful than our tendency to disengage from the plight of the poor and those on the margins. The beginning, he says, of the new script is the debut of love. It's full of grace, and it can knock you off your feet like the currents of the river. In his baptism, the script of Jesus' life was defined. And in our baptism, the script of our life is refocused. For 25 years, I was the pastor of churches before becoming a mid-council leader. And I love to tell stories, so bear with me this morning. Dr. Fred Craddock was one of the premier professors of homiletics when I was being trained. He told the story of about a man when he was a young pastor who was not committed to the church at all. The man told Dr. Craddock rather bluntly when they first met, I work hard, I take care of my family, and I mind my own business. I have no need for the church. In other words, leave me alone. Well, Dr. Craddock did still maintain the friendship. Several years later, though, something happened in the man's life. And he came to Dr. Craddock and he asked to be baptized and to join the church. And so he was baptized and joined the church. More time passed and one day Dr. Craddock was in conversation with him about what had shifted. Dr. Craddock says, remember when you used to tell me all the time way back then, that you work hard, that you take care of your family, and that you mind your own business? The man said, yep, I remember. Dr. Craddock said, well, do you still do that? Yep, said the man. Dr. Craddock then asked, well, what's the difference? The guy thought for a moment. Then he said, I didn't know what my business was back then. What is our business? In Jesus' baptism, an evolutionary movement of love was reinitiated. Felina Hurwitz, in her book, Mindful Silence, says, as children of God, we have divine DNA. We are created for divine purposes in the world. In our baptism, we're reminded that our primary business 
is to pursue with passion and energy the peace, love, and justice of Jesus Christ. Something else that began to shift as we hear this story that comes out. In his baptism, Jesus was identified as God's son. After Jesus, this baptism, a voice from heaven was heard saying, This is my son, the beloved. This past March, my mother died. And I told the following story at her funeral. At that funeral, there were probably at least a dozen other Presbyterian ministers who had heard the story, and maybe you have. I think it still speaks powerfully into our lives. Dr. Fred Craddock, the one I told the story of just a moment ago, found himself with his wife together in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. A distinguished older gentleman came to the table in their hotel dining room. He was, as it turned out, a celebrity. He was a former governor of the state of Tennessee. When he discovered that Dr. Craddock was a professor of preaching, the man said he had a story to tell him about a preacher. So he did. Seems that when the governor was born, his mother was not married. Now, this was in the 1930s or 40s. He never knew his father. Now, that may seem not so unusual today. But in the south in that area, that made for a very, very difficult childhood. The other children would taunt him. They'd call him names. They would ask him when his father was coming home. Whenever he was out with his mother in public, he was painfully aware that he only had one parent. One day when he was about 10 years old, the boy was in church. Usually when the service was over, he snuck out the back door which meant that he never talked to the minister, never had to share his name. And yet on this particular Sunday, the boy got swept up in the crowd, and before he knew it, he found himself face to face with the minister at the front door. The minister's voice boomed out. Well, son, whose boy are you? You can imagine he could not have asked a more embarrassing question. The boy flushed, started to stammer. But before he could say anything at all, the pastor, still gripping his head, said, I know who you are. You're God's son. He slapped the young man on the back and said, Boy, go claim your inheritance. That boy never forgot that incident. The minister's kindness was always about he was God's son. And he never forgot those final words. Go claim your inheritance. Long after, he became one of the most popular governors in Tennessee. This man delighted in telling this story of the day that the minister told him that he was a child of God. Christ in his baptism and in our own baptism, God says, you are my daughter. You are my son. You are the beloved in whom I am well pleased.
in the ritual waters of baptism, we refocus and remember that our business is the movement of God's revolutionary love in Jesus Christ. And that we are God's beloved. Amen. Go out into God's world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Spirit bless you and keep you this day, and always, always. Amen.